Yes, thank you for that very kind introduction. It's a really great pleasure to have the opportunity to talk to you today, um, especially given the very strong and long relationships that have existed between ISIS and uh, Scandinavia over many years since the late 1980s. Um, so uh, what I'd like to do today is to really give you um, an overview of the facility. Uh, if you're familiar with neutrons and muons, there'll be some background that will not be challenging for you, but if uh, hopefully for those of us not so familiar with the techniques, it'll just give a bit of uh, background as to why we're interested in these things. Um, I'll give you a bit of a context about some of the research examples that we're driving forward, tell you a little bit about how we've responded to COVID, how you can access these facilities and, and what we see as our major developments uh, going forward. So let's let let's let's dive straight in. Um, and and the, the, the spirit of the talk today will really be about providing unique information about the structure, atomic structure, molecular structure, nanoscale structure, macroscopic structure, and dynamics of materials that really you can't get by other techniques. I think there is a uh, neutrons and muons are, are in such short supply that actually if you can do these measurements with other techniques you should do so and so we really want to play to the strengths of the techniques but let's let's give you a little bit of background if you've not visited um, the Rutherford site before um, this is what it looks like probably today it's I'm just looking out the window it's a gray sky but but reasonably clear um, and so this is the uh, Rutherford African laboratory part of the Harwell campus um, actually uh, later on, I should be talking about our activities in terms of clean growth and circular economy. And actually, ISIS is a nice example of that because it, it arose from an existing um, proton synchrotron, the uh, Nimrod 7 GeV proton synchrotron, which was housed in here. Um, the actual spallation source was approved in 1977, quite a brave decision to go for what was a relatively new technology in terms of spallation, so accelerated driven sources especially given the wealth of experience that the UK has in, in reactor sources for neutrons, as was demonstrated at the Harwell site just over off the side of the picture here. So a brave decision in 77 resulted in the uh, opening of target station one, um, which is a, a 160 kilowatt uh, target station that opened in 1984, opened by the then Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher, who was a, a chemistry graduate, so she had a very uh, particular interest in, in ISIS in 1984. Um, and then in 2009, we opened the second target station, which is a low power target station, only 40 kilowatts, as opposed to the 160 kilowatts of TS1, but actually taking advantage of a lot of the developments in things like optics, detectors, moderators, neutronics, to really holistically design a, a super efficient target station. And so even though the power is low in the second target station, the neutronic output and the scientific output are, are very high. Um, this picture is already out of date. Um, and in one way it's out of date is that um, in terms of the uh, idea of clean growth and sustainability in our lives, but also in science, um, we're also uh, generating our own electricity, which I'll show in a little bit of, in a slide just in a while. Um, but also an important part of the campus is not only do we have the ISIS neutron and muon source, but we also have the third generation diamond X-ray synchrotron. We have some of the UK's most intense uh, lasers and increasingly important, we have our scientific computing department. One of the big frontiers for our research is the ability to model and describe our data. There's really no purpose in us producing beautiful data if it can't be interpreted and then ultimately used to design new materials and so on and so forth. And so having the scientific expertise on site as part of our wider engagement with our community is a really uh, important holistic way to do science. And so lots of the examples that I'll describe today really play on these synergies between all of the facilities. Um, so I just said, I had a little bit of slide on all that, why this was out of date. So this is if you were to look down on the top of TS2, which is building here now, you'd see it is uh, covered in PVs, which is really great. Um, so we have something now like 800 kilowatts of installed power just on R80, this is TS2 alone, um, which um, is, will take out hopefully 200 tons of carbon, but it's a small step. Uh, accelerating protons is an expensive business. 
It takes a lot of energy. Uh, ICES typically runs at about 12 megawatts in an operational cycle. So obviously 800 kilowatts is, is a relatively small amount uh, of, to take off the top of that. But I think it's important that we all take a responsibility for the sustainability of the science that we do. And, and we'll come on to that a little bit later when we talk about that clean growth and circular economy. So just as a few headlines to give you uh, an idea for the scale of our activities. We are a national facility, but we're international in scope. So we have a number of instruments, over 30, between our neutron and beyond instruments. And there are some numbers here that I'm particularly pleased with. One is the very large student uh, PhD training aspect that we do. You can see uh, this is in 2019-2020, uh, so before the impacts of COVID. So almost 800 PhD visits, which, which is really important. And we take that training aspect of our uh, program very seriously. And I think it helps that we have an amazing staff who really engage with the PhD students, postdocs and so on to support uh, the principal investigators. Um, a lot of user visits in total, over 3,000. Um, working with a range of companies, and this number is continually increasing, uh, particularly in the uh, energy sector, engineering, chemicals, and increasingly in the microelectronics sector. And we might give an example of that later on. Typically, uh, latest data is over 600 publications. So this, the trend in publications seems to be going up. Okay, it, 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 it kind of scales with the number of instruments that you produce and the number of days you run. But that's a nice trend where we're seeing 600 high impact publications. Uh, and a metric that I'm particularly keen on is the, is the number of new users. So um, I think it's easy to think that neutrons are a mature technique there. The user community is stable, it's not changing, but actually it's dynamically evolving. So over a third of our users are new users have never used the facility before. So that's a real challenge to us to look after our new uh, colleagues. But of course, it's a really energizing and exciting place to be as a result of that. I said we were a national facility, um, but I just showed this plot here on the left-hand side, which is the origins of our principal investigators. It's slightly out of date, um, so it has changed a little bit, um, but you can see uh, throughout Europe, uh, ISIS has a very strong uh, reputation and footprint from across uh, Europe. Scandinavia, particularly well represented. Uh, Sweden in particular has had a partnership with us since 1988, which is recently, uh, a few months ago has been extended by another five years. And that's developed real step changes in our instrumentation, Polaris, IMAT, and really supported the engagement of the, of the Swedish community. And I think we see this where, where countries engage with the facility, you really see a growth in that community. So Sweden is our largest uh, international community, about 5% of the user program. Um, and a similar thing has happened in this case with India. You can see that we have a lot of uh, users coming from India. And that's a result of the Indian government engaging with, with ISIS uh, and providing uh, support and resources to allow Indian users to access our facilities. A lot of interest in Japan, as you can imagine, uh, North America um, and uh, even um, uh, South America and also uh, um, South Africa. So, so national facility, but with a huge um, international profile. Um, so if you really want to dig and find a lot more. Uh, our annual review from 2020 um, is on the web. Uh, the link is here. You can maybe get to it in the recording. Uh, and that's a really nice um, uh, description, a cataloging of, of, of a lot of the activities that we do. And if you really want to understand about a sort of almost how, how do you build your own spallation neutron source, there's a really nice guide that we've just published on the web page. Uh, in the UK, if you're old enough, you kind of remember Ladybird books that would kind of take a complex topic and kind of introduce it to you. And this is our kind of uh, ladybird equivalent of how to build a, a neutron source. So um, I was asked to just talk a little bit about the next thing, which is something that, that we probably don't want to talk about, but is actually um, in some ways is, 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 is a big success story and is a huge credit to our staff. And that, that is of course the impact of the COVID pandemic. We are by and large an experimental facility and as such, we have we rely on people coming to our beam lines, doing experiments, making materials, um, writing code, and so on and so forth. And that's just not been possible um, under the, the the restrictions, which hopefully we're starting to see uh, the relaxation of. But actually, at ISIS, I think we've responded incredibly well. Um, we've run two and a half cycles now, 
under COVID restrictions. So we have about a month left of our third cycle before we go into our long shutdown, which I'll talk about at the end. And in that period, we've largely had no users. So most of the access has been remote. Here's just some examples of staff and users uh, installing various things on various beam lines. Um, we've completed well over 500 experiments. Um, uh, typically in a cycle, we maybe have 20, 30, 40 users, but all in very small groups, a group being sort of one researcher or maybe two under special circumstances. But I think the staff have, have responded dramatically. And in a way that I think is, is, is a great testament to them, but also slightly surprising in the sense that in a normal cycle, we would maybe deliver an efficient program at, at the level of sort of over 90%. So over 90% of our beam days would get used doing good science. And under COVID, that number has shrunk. I thought it might halve or be even smaller, but it's 80%. So we're still able to deliver a strong program, but it comes at a huge cost to staff who are having to support uh, a lot of external users who are able to access things uh, remotely and so on. Um, so yeah, I'd just like to publicly thank all of our staff for the work they've done under COVID. And, and one of the things that's come together to try and enable that is uh, before we started the, the lecture today, we discussed about new technologies. And one of our new technologies is IDAS, which is, um, you can tell we're not great at acronyms, ISIS Data Analysis as a Service. And so this is a basically an STFC cloud with a huge amount of compute resource that people can actually access remotely, create a de desktop, here's uh, one from our Inelastic colleagues, uh, and multiple people can engage simultaneously on this desktop. Uh, and so it's a very nice collaboration tool so that people can look at their data in real time, they can analyze their data, and actually all of the things they need are brought together in one place, namely access to the data, access to the compute resource, access to the data reduction software, access to the analysis, it all comes together. And so each of our groups, I'm sorry, this is too small, you probably can't see it, have sort of created an adapted environment, a bespoke environment, in which our users can uh, can analyze their data. So that's really been a something of a game changer. And I think um, obviously the sort of degree of serendipity with the arrival of COVID, but obviously this has been a thing that's been long in the planning and it just arrived exactly at the right time. So, okay, uh, you're all very familiar with this, so let's run through it quite quickly. So neutrons have a lot of interesting properties. Their energies allow us to study the excitations, vibrations in materials, collective modes, um, the wavelengths are comparable to atomic spacing, so we get this exquisite description of crystal structures with kind of femtometer resolution, um, right up to a kind of uh, the nanoscale, micron scale, and even to macroscopic. Particularly important that we interact with the nuclei, so we are sensitive to light atoms, um, so the scattering power of uh, atoms with, um, with neutrons varies quasi-randomly across the periodic table, unlike with x-rays, whereas you know it goes with a number of electrons. So we're very good at seeing light atoms. So if hydrogen is important to you, for example, then we can study that even when it's in the presence of much heavier atoms. Uh, and we can also do isotopic substitution, which means we can swap hydrogen for deuterium, which has a different scattering power, so we can light up different parts of the structure. Uh, and we'll probably see examples of that. Neutrons are neutral particles. So that means they're very highly penetrating. We can get inside complex sample environment which are very low temperatures, very high temperatures, controlled humidities, uh, in situ sample changes, um, whole range of things. Uh, you can go through a lot of uh, liquid, for example, to get to an interface that you need to study, or a lot of metal to get to a, a weld that you need to study. They have a magnetic moment. Uh, it's a spin half particle, so we have a dipole moment, so we can study magnetic structures, fluctuations, and so on. And we can polarize them and, and do lots of tricks to really separate out the important information in a measurement. So the other technique that we have, which is, um, is exotic, I mean, muons are exotic particles, um, is uh, muon spectroscopy. So this is different to the neutron technique that we'll talk about in that muons are implanted in materials and they process in a local field in the material. They tend to go to sides which they have a large electronegativity. They process in the local field and then 2.2 microseconds later, they decay, they, de they emit some neutrinos and a positron, we detract the positron. And the interesting point is the positron is preferentially emitted in the direction that the muon is pointing at the time it decayed. So you can see if you measure up enough statistics, you're able to 
back calculate the local environment that the muir must have been sitting in to give you that profile in time okay so this is um a, a really powerful technique which is very sensitive to incredibly small moments so for example if you have a complex superconductor that breaks time reversal symmetry um, where you might expect yeah, a very small moments much smaller than you can measure with neutrons uh, at the level of what you can measure with techniques x-ray techniques like xmcd then the muons are a, a really powerful technique um, uh, to study uh, those sort of systems and you can also do something interesting with uh, things like battery materials as, as we'll show um, so the, the, the key to ISIS is that we're a spallation neutron source. So without going into too much detail, essentially we bring a high energy beam of protons. It smashes into a heavy metal target, in our case, tantalum. Uh, the nucleus absorbs that proton, gets a lot of energy, gets excited, starts to boil and starts to kick off a whole load of other particles, um, uh, which then actually can go on and, and can generate more neutrons. But typically you get about 15, 16 neutrons for every proton that hits our heavy metal target. Okay, so we have something like 10 to the 15 protons, which gives us over two 10 to the 16 uh, neutrons. Okay, those are all at very high energies. So our instant proton beam is typically of the order of hundreds of mega electron volts, in our case, 800 MeV. And that means we produce neutrons up to that energy. So we have a lot of very high energy neutrons. For the most part, we want to slow those down to the kind of energies that you find in systems. So that's angstrom wavelengths or milli electron volts in energy. And we do that with moderation. And then we do that 50 times a second, 10 times a second. So unlike a reactor, which is a continuous source, we have our neutrons produced in pulses. And the difference between our source compared to the source that's being built in the ESS is our, our proton pulse is very short, it's of order 100 microseconds, whereas at the ESS it's much longer. So we have a short bright pulse and the ESS uses that extra time to, uh, to, to, to couple more power into the target to give you a large um, integrated neutron flux, whereas we get it all in a, in a, in a peak. And that then fl flows through into the instrumentation that we have. So this time of flight is, is a natural choice for pulse sources because you'll see that by knowing distances and times, you can determine the energy wavelength of your neutron, and therefore you can do your scattering and elastic measurements and so on. Typically, just as a, a piece of information, um, a thermal neutron is of order kilometer per second. So if you measure distances to better than a millimeter, you need to be timing on the kind of microsecond time scale. And that's all very feasible with modern uh, electronics. Um, I'm very poor at PowerPoint animation, so I'm gonna skip that, but that was a proton beam hitting a target, neutrons being produced, moderated, interact with a sample and into a detector. So, so what does that mean for an experiment? Um, let's just take one example. And this case is, is diffraction. So we're going to have our moderator or our source of neutrons. We're going to have a sample and we're going to just have a single detector at some distance and at some angle. Okay, so we put a sample in. And the key feature here of the, the neutron technique is that within a single detector, we measure the entire diffraction pattern because basically the, the despacing in your crystal is gonna be proportional to the time of flight. So if you know the distance between the moderator and the sample, the sample and the detector, you know the scattering angle, then you can basically measure an entire spectrum. It's a very simple expression. You can see within a single detector, we measure this entire spectrum. But of course, we don't just have a single detector. We actually have multiple detectors, which we can then group and focus to improve the statistics, um, play around with resolution uh, and so on and so forth. So a very powerful technique. We don't just have diffraction, of course, we have uh, the full spectrum of techniques. We have a range of instrumentation to study the structure and morphology of materials, uh, including um, chip irradiation that we might talk about. We have a range of spectrometers to allow us to study the dynamics of materials. And then we have um, a lot of ancillary support facilities that users can access to produce uh, bespoke deuterated materials, um, a very well-equipped characterization lab, that allows you to do complementary x-ray measurements, magnetometry, um, and so on and so forth. So we have kind of 30 instruments that we kind of group into various uh, disciplines and really taking advantage of the fact that we have two target stations because that allows us to tune the instrumentation to actually match the science that we want to do. So this particular target station here, number two, 
is a very good source of cold long wavelength neutrons, which are very amenable to techniques like uh, when you want to look at large scale objects, such as small angle scatter and reflectometry and looking for complex magnetic structures with large D spacings, for example. So those scientific exam applications, it's a real challenge within a, a half an hour or so to talk about some of the science. You, you could spend many days talking about the science, but let's just kind of give a feel and, and I, I won't have the time to go in any great detail, but hopefully they'll give you a flavor for the kind of things that we, uh, that we do. So I've chosen um, clean growth as a sort of, um, as one of the, the kind of buckets into which we can put our res research. And this is important clearly uh, it's one of the UK's government's priorities for as part of a clean environment, sustainable growth, um, and so on. Uh, interestingly, the government recently, end of last year, published a, a, a 10 point plan for a green industrial revolution. Um, the UK has ambitious targets uh, for net zero in terms of fossil fuel by 2050. UKRI, my employer, has set a target for its facilities to be carbon neutral by 2040. Uh, and so clearly this is something that we need to be contributing to. And of course, the good news is that neutrons and muons have a huge uh, potential for impact um, in this area, um, whether it be um, in offshore wind power, carbon sequestration, photovoltaics, uh, fuel cells, um, relifing uh, reactors, uh, nuclear reactors, uh, and so on. The neutrons have a, a, a really important role to play. And so we don't just do a single thing in clean growth, we actually reach across a very wide range of areas. So let, let, let's have a, a little bit of a, a dive into some of these areas. Um, I think a, a rather nice example uh, recently is from colleagues looking at next generation um, materials for solid state batteries. Um, so this is um, a, a lithium lanthanum tungsten oxygen system. So the lithiums are the yellow color here. So those, of course, are the ions that are going to be carrying the charge around for us. And this has a, a double perovskite structure. And of course, with neutron diffraction, you can go in and really resolve the structure with, with, with great resolution. And in fact, um, these figures down here, I apologize, I made them a little bit too small. If you concentrate on the lithiums, this is, this is the, how the structure changes as you load it up with lithium. And you can see at the highest lithium concentrations, you can see what happens is that the lithium actually generates clusters, uh, lithium oxygen-4 clusters, which locate on a particular side, the A site, within this double perovskite structure. So neutrons give you this absolute determination of where the atoms are and what the atoms are. So you've got this, this really powerful determination of the structure. Of course, you might also like to know about how uh, those lithiums are moving around in the system. And this is where uh, the muon technique can play an, an important role. Um, recall that muons are sensitive to the local environment. So if a muon implants itself into a structure um, at a place where there's a large electronegativity, then as the lithium ion, which has a nuclear moment, as that moves past the muon site, it perturbs the local magnetic environment, which the muon senses. And here you can see this is, uh, I don't want to go into too much details, but this is the muon signal as a function of that decay time. Remember the muon has a lifetime of 2.2 microseconds. And so you can actually infer the hopping rate of the iron from the muon data. If you look at it as a function of temperature, you can work out what the activation barriers are. This doesn't just work for uh, lithium, it works well for sodium, it can work with a whole load of other materials. So, so next generation battery technologies are probably gonna be amenable to this uh, site. And what you can see, this is a function of temperature. You can see here at mu, this is the, the rate at which the field that the muon sees is fluctuating. And you can see nothing's happening, nothing's happening. And then at some point, the, um, the lithium start to move and you can measure your diffusion coefficients. Now you can measure it in other ways than muons. You can do it with uh, electron, uh, electron impedance spectroscopy and you get this answer. Um, and if you do with muons, you get a reasonably similar answer. There's a little bit of disagreement there. You can also measure the activation barrier from this temperature dependence, and you find that muons see a much lower activation barrier than, uh, than is measured with a bulk microscopic technique. And of course, the reason for that is that the muon is a local probe. So it doesn't see things like grain boundaries, which obviously um, in any kind of transport measurement 
you're going to are going to impact uh, the ability of the lithiums to move around. So there's a direct measure there of the of the impact of grain boundaries on this uh, transport of lithium ions, which is so important in these uh, materials. Um, this is a nice example of um, from uh, Shihai Yang's group in, in Manchester, which is trying to develop materials to more efficiently um, to reduce the energy and environmental cost of producing materials, in this case polymers. Uh, and this is um, to do with alkenes, uh, propene, uh, ethylene that need to be separated from alkynes before they can be converted into polymers. Now, typically, uh, zeolites are, are kind of quite inefficient at this process, but the group at Manchester realized that by adding uh, nickel, uh, which is the green atom here, these are neutron structures uh, determined by powder diffraction, you can actually see that the um, the alkenes are actually binding selectively at the nickel two plus site. So the chemio selective binding, uh, and, and I apologize, you can't see the numbers here, um, but you see they have this absolute determination of um, the uh, the loading of acetylene, ethylene, et cetera, um, on these systems. So not only can we say where these molecules are binding, but we can also talk about the dynamics. And this is what's shown here. This is some inelastic uh, neutron scattering, which compares um, the, the, the solid acetylene with the acetylene that's bound to the nickel sites. And you can start to see all of the, 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 the changes to the, trans excuse me, the translational, librational, vibrational modes in this structure. So not only do you have this determination of the structure, you also understand um, how these atoms are moving around. Whoops. Sorry, I don't know what happened there. My computer has just stopped, as is always the way. Let's see if it comes back. Okay, so give me a second. Just take your time, don't worry. Yeah. I'm... And I take the chance to say to the audience that if you have questions, please don't be shy and uh, just uh, write them on the chat and we will share them with our speaker. Meanwhile, we try to fix. Is yeah. technical issue? Yes, I'm sorry about that. Of course, I ran through the slides a couple of times this morning and nothing went wrong. I mean, I guess there's a possibility that it's a high energy neutron has hit my computer, <laughs> uh, which is something we can study, but not something I wanted to study during the talk. So yeah, of course. <laughs> this is going to come back. It's always like this. Things crash. At the wrong moment. Yeah, give me a second. But well, we experienced with Anurag the worst cases. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> with um, our US speakers. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. My PowerPoint is coming back. It's. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I think it's you know, working it probably. Let's, uh, let's see what it says. I do apologize. Right, let's close that. It's okay. Um, Share the screen again. I think it should work like this. <clears throat> yes, great. So we, we, can, we can directly jump can probably to this slide. See, see if I can get back to where I was. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it was interesting maybe in some ways because the example I was going to give is about death. <laughs> the death of my computer. I probably, you know, spontaneously. <laughs> so so, so I, I don't know why I call this clean growth, but it sort of feels a bit like the kind of circular economy, maybe the circle of life. And, and this is just uh, some really nice work from our colleagues in Italy. Uh, oh, wonderful. Uh, so I give you back the word then. No? <laughs> a, a, another uh, collaboration, long term collaboration, in this case with Lazio. Um, Perfect. Uh, yes, it's where, a region that I know very well because yes, I'm from there. Excellent. <laughs> so, so they, they have realized that actually um, you can, there's a very clean signature in inelastic neutron scattering uh, which relates to the temperature at which bones were burnt. And so if you want to understand the uh, funereal kind of processes that took place in the first century AD, actually inelastic neutrons can, can give you a key here. Uh, and what these guys realized is that when you burn a bone, the, the bone matrix undergoes some structural and dimensional changes, which make it, it very difficult to use kind of more conventional osteometric methods. And so what they did was to combine 
inelastic neutron scattering, Fourier transform infrared, micro-ROM and so on, to actually um, uh, look for the signatures, which allows you to differentiate bones that are burnt at 400, 500, 800 degrees C uh, and so on. So um, yeah, I don't know what this relevance this has for modern forensic pathology and so on, but um, it's good to see that neutrons are really kind of um, given us new insight into what was happening in the first century. So, so let's let's roll forward. Let's look at nanoscale and quantum. And, and again, I think this plays to the government's uh, agenda of transformative technologies and, and also healthcare, actually. Um, so I'll just give a few examples. I realize I've lost a little bit of time there. Uh, hopefully we can recover some of that. Uh, and this first example is, um, is one where colleagues at the University of Cambridge created uh, little memory stores. Now we're all familiar with microelectronics, but we're very familiar with 2D planar structures. So if you think about your chip or your storage in a computer, it's, it's on two dimensions. But of course, if you can go in three dimensions, then you have potential to massively increase the storage density and so on and so forth. And so this is an example whereby you can create these little nanoscale structures. So these layers, in this case, are uh, an alloy of cobalt, iron and boron, a few nanometers thick, separate them with a very thin spacer layer, in this case, ruthenium. And their natural ground state is for them all to be antiferromagnetically coupled, okay? We can then apply a field pulse and actually flip one of these layers. And you can see here now, we've flipped this layer. We can, so we've basically got an information store. This is a, a little piece of information. We can apply another field and flip it up. And again, and we can move it through the stack. So we've got basically a shift register where we can move information, and therefore transport data through this structure. If you look at a conventional technique like, um, like MOC, for example, you get these complex patterns where you can sort of indirectly infer what might be going on. But with polarized neutrons in this case and reflectometry, uh, here's some of the data, you can absolutely definitively define what these structures are. So these structures that you see here are cartoons, but they're extracted from the neutron data. So we precisely know what's going on in our little structure. So there's an example of a metallic system on the nanoscale. We can also study um, uh, soft matter as well. This is a, a recent example from Zoom, our, our, one of our latest instruments, a small angle instrument, which um, is work with colleagues in, um, in Diamond in Japan, uh, Switzerland, Italy. So, so huge collaborations in this case, creating these interlocking structures um, that you can kind of engineer their properties. And, and the, the really amazing thing here is that you can organize these structures in a self-assembly that they start to interlock, which is really difficult to do. So you have to have these kind of pre-annular molecules that then pre-organize and that then give you uh, these little structures. Now, um, I do wonder if the reason this is in nature is because we have the Olympic rings here in what turns out to be an Olympic year. But of course, this is, this is just a, a microscopy. Uh, uh, this is an atomic force microscopy that shows you this image. So it's very nice. But what neutrons allow you to do is with some modeling is to not only see the structure, but also to see inside the structure. And so each of these has a little kind of structure, which is a so-called core shell model. And we can see inside that, we can see the interpenetration of the solvent molecules um, and so on, which you can't get from other techniques. And actually looking inside materials is clearly a, a big part of what, of what we do. So here's a nice example from the healthcare. And this is work uh, from Umea, Lund, Gothenburg for NMR. This is looking at um, uh, a cancer causing protein, PCL2. Um, and I think this is a nice comparison that NMR provides you with the structural and dynamic information on the, the atomic to the protein molecule level. Whereas what neutrons give you is this, um, the location, the molecular compounds, their volumetric contributions. In this case, you can see that this particular uh, protein is tail anchored into the membrane. In this case, you can see it's embedded and so on. So, so just a huge amount of information. Um, I'm going to jump forward, if I may, and just talk a little bit about uh, just a couple of examples from engineering and imaging, which I think is, is an important part uh, of what we do that, that plays to this agenda of, of uh, transformative technologies. So with neutrons, as I said, we can see inside material in real space through radiography and tomography, or we can see it through diffraction. Um, and this is a nice example uh, of studying uh, monopiles. These are the things that uh, support offshore wind turbines. 
they're big, they're typically 10 meters in diameter, um, 70 meters in length. And with neutrons, you can actually go in and look at the welds within a monopile. Okay, and not only can you do that, you actually get the full stress tensor. So you get all directions uh, in, in your measurement. Uh, and so if you can understand the stresses and strains in a monopole, then you can increase the lifetime of uh, offshore wind turbines, which reduces the cost, uh, increases the uh, capacity, and so on and so forth. So it's a really nice example between Cranfield, OU, and colleagues in Norway, um, which have been able to fully characterize the, um, the stress in the monopole, monopiles. Interestingly, that stress is far higher than when you measure with other techniques. Um, so so uh, it's really important to know that. So that's using diffraction, but we can also do that using imaging. And here's some nice examples from uh, my colleague Genevieve Berker at IMAT. Um, so we have this beautiful image at the top of uh, ammonite. You can see, um, you can compare what you see um, with neutrons um, here compared to what you see with x-rays. There's an ammonite, um, and, I, and I think this is, just, this is just really nice work where, where um, Genevieve has extended these measurements over to plant science. And this is really looking at how water uptake uh, and, and the impact of soil and so on, on on plant systems. And this is a really nice example of where you combine uh, neutron imaging with X-ray imaging to give this complete uh, determination because they see different things. So you start to highlight different components of the system. The, the component that's containing water, uh, the heavier components and so on, very clearly seen with, um, uh, with neutrons. So this is, let's get this right. This is the combined image. This is the neutron image, I think, have I got that right? Yeah, uh, okay, we'll come back to that. So you can use similar technologies and apply them to batteries. Um, this is a lithium thionyl chloride battery, which has a nice capability of being an extremely low self-discharge. And here's some imaging uh, from Ralph Zischer at UCL. This is a very nice PhD thesis. I encourage you all to take a look at that. This is white beam imaging, uh, looking at um, something like 7,000 projections as you rotate the battery and the beam, about 30 seconds each, giving you a resolution of better than 80 microns. And you can start to see all the different things here. You can start to see the lithium anode. Uh, you can see as it's discharging, you can see this flower pattern, which is the porous carbon skeleton that they use to provide channels uh, for transport in this material. You can see the uh, SO2 gas reservoir as they start to, to billow out. And you can see this um, in, in, uh, as a function of time as the battery uh, discharges. So, so really, um, really impressive. Um, I told you that we can uh, irradiate microelectronics, um, and this is our chip IR facility, which is a facility that allows us to produce very high energy neutrons and introduce them to microelectronics. High energies meaning neutrons that we produce up to that 800 MeV level, which is very similar to the spectrum you get in the upper atmosphere. So one hour in our beam is like 100 years uh, in a plane flying over the Atlantic. So a very good way of accelerating the safety, uh, the, the performance of microelectronics and their resilience to high energy neutrons that can cause damage, errors, and physical damage in, in microelectronics. And that's an increasingly important area. I'll skip to this very briefly. Um, ordinarily, we would run a lot of hands-on training exercises, whether that's uh, neutrons, muons, a lot of virtual resources uh, available to the users. Um, and of course, this year, that's not been possible. We've run a few things um, in the virtual environments, but hopefully we're very much looking forward to bringing those back online um, in the coming year. I should say we have a very strong PhD program. We funded over 40 students um, at, up to the present day. And if you take a look at our webpage um, here, uh, you'll find some of the active positions that are, that are currently uh, available. So if you're so interested, uh, please take a look. So just to summarize then, what, what are we uh, going to do next? So of course we have a roadmap. This is rather a complicated figure. We're somewhere here, which tells you we're just about to go into a long shutdown. And the reason for that is we're basically replacing the heart of target station one. So we are producing a new target, uh, new moderators, new reflectors, and so on. We're doing an awful lot of work on our accelerator as well. So we'll come back with a new TS1 um, early in the new year, which is great given the age of this, this system. Um, of course, ESS figures largely in our activities. We're doing a lot of work on things like data streaming. Um, and one of the things that I'm 
particularly involved with is two of the instruments that we're building at ESS. First one being Loki, which will be one of the first instruments, it's a small angle scattering instrument. And you can see kind of various components here. Here's the heavy shutter, here's the detector tank, here's collimation that's all being built. Um, and so we look forward to that being installed at ESS. And our second instrument is a little bit later in the design process is Freya, which will be a, a, a reflectometer for liquid surfaces and, 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 and so on. And these, these should offer us uh, really game-changing performance uh, in terms of what we can do at ESS. At my own facility, we are uh, developing our next generation of instrumentation. Endeavor is a series of projects that we are currently developing uh, awaiting um, uh, funding, which, which uh, we are hopeful will arrive next year. But if you're so interested, there's a range of workshops we're holding uh, in July. Uh, please have a look at the website, our website, you'll find those where we will be discussing those instruments in, in a bit more detail. Uh, we have bigger ambitions, uh, and that's recognizing the fact that the UK will need a new neutron source around the kind of 20, 30 timescale. So we're currently in the process of really quite detailed uh, feasibility studies, physics design studies, uh, looking at new technologies, um, looking very much at the energy sustainability argument. We have to make facilities that uh, have a low environmental footprint, even though we're going to do great research in terms of uh, sustainable and clean growth, we still need to minimize the environmental impact of what it is we do at the large scale facilities. Um, so there's a lot of activity on that at the moment, which um, is, is very, very encouraging. All of these facilities, you can access them through a range of mechanisms. Our next proposal deadline is, is currently proposed, uh, sorry, postponed because of COVID, but it's likely to be the end of this year for TS2. And that would give time on the instruments around the March period in 22 and early 2022 for the TS1 instruments that come on later. As part of the shutdown, when we come out of that, we expect TS2 to start up earlier um, than TS1. So there's various access mechanisms. You can do the direct one, which is the one I've just kind of described twice a year. You can apply for time at any point in time if you need rapid access. We have express access for uh, the me quick measurements of samples, testing ideas, cleaning up people's PhD thesis and so on. Uh, and then of course we have dedicated um, industrial time. So just to summarize, um, hopefully I've shown you that both neutrons and muons possess this amazing range of characteristics that are very well matched to curiosity and technologically driven research. We're seeing trends uh, of complexity um, driving emergent behavior. We're looking at a multi-scale approach. So we want to study materials on many lens scales and on many energy, many energy scales. We're bringing together the complementarity of the facilities on our campus, be that computing, neutrons, muons, uh, photons, uh, and so on. Increasingly multimodal measurements, where we're not just measuring in elastic spectra, we're measuring um, in situ MOG, in situ Raman, whatever it may be. Um, and increasing that, that, that frontier that I talked about right at the start of theory modeling and software. And we're also uh, very lucky that we have an expert and engaged staff. And so if you have an idea for an experiment, you'll certainly have somebody at the lab who will be interested and be able to guide you through that process and try and support you to deliver a really good experiment. So with that, I recognize we've run over a little bit because of the technical hitches, but I'd just like to, um, to thank you um, for your attention and also to thank all of my colleagues at the lab who provided basically all the information um, for the things I was able to just talk about. So thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and on behalf of all the audience, uh, we really thank you for such a great talk. So now is the time for questions. And we have couples of one. So we can start. Mm -hmm. So there's one question is about, so the staff at large scale facilities have a chance to do some research below the radar. So how do you rate the innovation of the research led at ISIS compared to that led through the traditional university route? So I think, first of all, I'll, I'll, I'll challenge the, the, the premise of the question. Um, all of the um, research that we run at the facility has gone through uh, a process of peer review. So unlike many facilities at, at ISIS, we don't allocate in-house research time. Uh, I know many facilities do, and we can have a discussion around that. We, we, we don't do that. And so staff compete um, in the, the, the peer review proce process as, as, as other people. 
what they do have is the opportunity to take out small parts of the program for commissioning. Uh, and so I think, and maybe this is at the heart of the question, that does allow people to develop uh, new techniques. And this is where our PhD program, has, I think, has been so successful because it allows you to develop new capabilities, uh, whether that be in situ NMR, for example, in situ growth capabilities. Um, and using that small amount of commissioning time, and it is a tiny amount, um, which is, again is, is reviewed and, and, and has to be justified. Um, I think that does give really good outcomes. So I, I would say very much that for me, the best science comes from the strong collaborations. Um, I'm old enough to be a fan of the film Spinal Tap. And if there's anybody on the call knows that film, you know, the, the staff at the facility know how to turn the experiment up to 11 uh, yes. because they're, they're living it every day. And so if you really want to push the boundaries of what's possible, then, you know, yeah. you work closely with those guys and they get you up to 11 and beyond. Um, and so I, I think, um, I'm not sure I'd make a value on, 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 on the quality, but I think when we work together, our industrial, our academic and our staff, when they work together, we get, we get the best outcomes. So yes. uh, that's partly why I think COVID has been such a difficult period because a lot of those natural interactions have had to reform in yeah. a different fashion. Yeah, we fully agree. Like collaboration is really the key of success. Yeah. And we're social people as well. I mean, we like we like having a meal together and, uh, yeah. and all those things yes. that happen on an experiment. <laughs> um, so we shouldn't shouldn't forget we're we're humans. No, exactly. But we hope that with this format, we can all interact today and ask more questions to our special speaker, Sean. So. Uh, yeah, in fact, the question was that followed was, so what does this say about the need for a UK national laboratory along the lines, for example, of CNRS, LMOTS, uh, uh, and the Department of, Department Department. of, uh, uh, of Energy Labs, for example. So this is also the following question from uh, one of our... Yeah, I mean, that, that, that's a really interesting question. Um, so the UK has things like the National Physical Laboratory, uh, which is a very different thing to what we have. We are actually called national laboratories um, because I think our scope, we, we clearly demonstrate that we do things that you can't do anywhere else in the country. And, and in many cases, you can't do anywhere else in the world. Um, I think that, you know, I, I, in my career, I've done a lot of work in, in the DOE uh, labs in the US, for example, uh, and that model works very well too. I think um, the, the challenge is gonna be for, for our future big projects like ISIS-2 is, is whether that's something that's still on the scale of a nation or if it's a more international en endeavor. At ISIS, because we have such strong international partnerships, we've mentioned Sweden, Italy, the Netherlands, India, um, I need to apologize if I forget any, um, but we just have this whole range of interactions and they just bring such a rich richness and diversity to the program that I think, um, you know, it's about trying to find that sweet spot of being yeah. a national lab and being well adapted to the UK's needs. But of course, science is global. And so we need to be part of that wider, wider community. So I, I guess there's opportunities and risks in going down a, a sort of DOE time model. Yeah. So yeah, uh, thank you for such a detailed uh, answer. And another question. So where would be the niche for ISIS uh, when ESS is fully up and running? Okay, that's a good a good question. Um, so, so the um, the answer to that, I think, is is it, it's quite nuanced and complex. But let me have a go, nonetheless. So, the first argument is that um, it takes a long time to get facilities operational. Uh, if you look at a lot of major investments, um, the time between them sort of really switching on, so producing photons or X-rays, there's almost a decade before those facilities are really developed. So ESS is, is, is getting closer to its uh, first operations, but there's still a period in which we need to build up that capacity and knowledge. And remember, ESS as a long pulse source is totally new. So whilst we've done a lot of modeling and we think we understand, we will be learning things throughout that process. So it's gonna take time and there's gonna be great achievement and there's gonna be mistakes and, and, and that's how these facilities come online. But there is that's an intrinsic a difference. Point. Uh, yeah, yeah. That's ESS is a long pulse target station, which means you've got a lot of power 
but you've got a uh, relatively poorer resolution. And so you play that off against the power by having longer instruments, by having complex chopper systems and so on. Mm -hmm. ISIS as a short pulse target station has a very intrinsic high resolution. And so I think it's gonna be a complementarity. It's gonna be about the experiments that you can do um, at ISIS where you absolutely need the high resolution. You know, we have um, one of the, if not one of two of the highest resolution instruments in the world, and they just provide new insight. So there are gonna be certain science examples where you need that insight. There are gonna be certain science examples where you need a very large energy range, wavelength range, where you need cold neutrons, you need epithermal neutrons that we do very well. Um, and then there's gonna be experiments where you need lots of flux. Um, yeah. We don't have that many neutrons, even at the most intense sources, we don't have that many neutrons. So I think there's gonna be a really nice complementarity between the long pulse source of ESS, short pulse ISIS, ISIS-2, it's very exciting developments at Oak Ridge in America with their second target station where they're, yes. they're taking an approach like us, a lower rep rate, um, high power target. So um, yeah, I think there's a really, I think neutron scatterers in Europe potentially have a really bright future uh, yeah, with, with these facilities. But I think, it, I think you do need this landscape, you do need this balance. Yeah, uh, next question. So, do you have joint proposals uh, uh, with Diamond to make best use of both X-rays and neutrons at both facilities? Yeah, so it, that's a good question. In, in a few cases we do, uh, where the science requests it. So um, things like small angle scattering, you can apply to one of our instruments and get time on a Diamond instrument. For pair distribution PDF measurements, you can do something similar. Um, so it's not a global thing. Uh, not for any instrument can you get on any other instrument, but in specific areas we've implemented that and, and it works very well uh, just because there is this natural complementarity that, that, that is, is, um, allows you to get this, this, this deeper insight into the material systems that you're, you're studying. So uh, you know that, that proximity, a bit like ESS and MAX4, uh, um, you know, you'll have that, that synergy, uh, which I think is, is, is really vital. And then you need to back it up with a computational resource as well. Thank you. I, I think we have time for a couple of questions. So there is a, another more general question, which is about like, uh, so can user have, uh, um, uh, yeah, testing time before the actual bin time? I think this is what uh, someone in the audience wanted to know, because some experiments might be a little bit exotic. People have a really hard time to, you know, to have the feeling of how the, the experiment will be actually once, uh, yeah, everything will be set up at the bin line. So uh, there, is there a proposal, a channel that people can apply for to get access to, uh, to test uh, new experiments? Yeah, so, so um, there's, there's various mechanisms that one, one can do this. Uh, and the express mechanism is something that we, we use this a lot for, where people have created a material and um, you know you can calculate the scattering pattern, but you're not entirely sure until you measure it. That's why we do experiments, of course. Um, and, and so that is a mechanism where people can just post in samples, and then at specific points in the cycle, we will run a huge number of samples, um, typically with with relatively straightforward conditions. You know, we're not going to be doing ultra high pressures or or whatever, but we can do temperature and so on and so forth. So that's one way of of getting um, materials developed in, in in preparation for an experiment. Interestingly, our peer review panels, quite often they will request exactly this. So they'll, they'll see a proposal come in and they think that's really exciting if you can do it. And so what we'd yeah. like you to do is go away and make that little test measurement that says, I've got this system with a tiny moment. Can I, can I see the moment in a magnetic case, for example? Um, and, and so then we would respond to that. Um, and then equally, it's about, um, you know, I think now the connection. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sorry. I'm sorry. There's a problem with the connection that jumped in the middle of your answer. So, okay. sorry. Um, we about to say if it's possible or not. <laughs> all right. So, 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 yeah, you can, uh, there are numerous mechanisms. Sorry, you can do it through Express. Um, if, it, if it needs more kind of a technique development, then discuss it with the local. 
contact and, and they, they can maybe um, make a case that there's some commissioning time. Oh, that's great. That would, would be useful. And um, yeah, and, and, and again, I think that's where, where our PhD program comes in so useful because often a lot of those developments are yes. being generated by those guys. And so we can, we can try out new things. And, and quite often you don't need neutrons to do the development. You just need to make sure your little widget fits in the right gap uh, uh, and so on. So, so, so yeah, it's all about the discussion. Um,